So we're singing uh, one more song. आनंद वलस बाधि इंटी मल्लीता मल्ल मन वाल चूस्मा चूड़ा एल बाधल मन की मन हापी गुर्चे कैमरा मुझे हापी गुन निजाने वाल बाधल पर्सनल चूसी ने फील ट्यून आनंद गशार श्रीनिवास गिटारिस्ट वन इलाद इलादा ऐडियन दी पट कटी मेमंदर कल पट इधर यह पाट पेर अना नागना मेरंदर भद्र उ चल रही अभी अभी 
ఒక మంచి అభిప్రాయంతో చేసిన సాంగ్ అన్నా నాగన్న opportunity uh, switch our uh, presentation and we are happy to uh, take part of this thank you so much we are happy to host you chavasta band and, uh, uh, and now i would like to uh, uh, yeah, invite uh, sainath sainath I, I, really hope, i really hope yashwant has recorded it at his end even despite the bandwidth problem that was beautiful and i really hope we get a full proper recording that that was lovely thank you it's we have already released this uh, song sir so it's there on youtube we'll share the link once it's please thank share you. thank you sir thank you sir i'm sure our audience uh, loved the performance uh, Uh, now i would like to invite uh, uh, sainath garu to to address uh, the impact of uh, covid 19 on the pool you know uh, you can hear me clearly can you hear me clearly? yes yes sir yes it's clear. yes sir yes. so i thought because of our earlier discussion before the program there were two or three key words that made me decide to start differently one word was old school and the other was uh, you know that you said that the teachers some of the teachers people a teachers union people are participating in this lecture let me begin with what is going on right now in the schools in the colleges in the education domain and what the heck it's going to do to poor people as of now all the private institutions are recalculating how they can save and make money out of the new situation right they did invest a lot of money in some degree of uh, infrastructure classrooms laboratories all these sort of things they did do that now they've got but they are going to learn that there are opportunities in moving education online they're going to hire far few teachers full time faculty etc that's one thing second they're going to move use far more freelancers at different locations without having to fly them down pay for their air fare anything by the way this this benefits people like me hmm? but what does it do to the student yeah. first question as we all start celebrating what's happening online and education becoming strong you can see that incidentally there's been an explosion in the uh, 
in Baiju and other apps, it's really, and Zoom itself, that that's going to be a very big thing from now on. Question, what happens to the millions and millions, tens of millions of little children in government schools and government colleges who have no such facilities, who have no access, and I mean, forget the children. Tell me how many of the teachers of these children have the facilities at home to go back and do this kind of work. Yeah. So one is a gigantic exclusion. We're talking about tens of millions yeah, of children. Let me, I just was looking at the figure this afternoon in Uttar Pradesh, just 6th standard to 12th standard, 6th class to 12th class, there are 11 million girls, 11 million. Now you take, and I mean, these are the ones, these are the poor ones. These are the ones in, mainly in government schools. You multiply that picture across the country and see how many tens of millions of kids are going to sit there in institutions that have never, you know, never had broadband and forget whether it's 4G, 5G, forget it. I mean, they're lucky if they've had something one step above dial-up. How are these children going to be included? Since we are all into inclusion, how are they going to be included in this education is one very big issue. Second is uh, the sheer destruction of one of the most important things in the socialization and education of the human race. That is the direct interaction between the teacher and the student and between student and student. How are you going to, I mean, I, I even fear for the elites who do have access. I even fear for those children who do have, have access that they're not going to be looking at a teacher in the classroom, that they're not going to be talking to their fellow students, that they're not going to be doing that. As it is, capitalism in the last 30 years has concentrated on atomizing all of us. Okay? We are atomized. You don't know your neighbors in the neighboring flat. You don't know the guy who lives there, what he does, what his name is. We're all in that sense already alienated from each other. And now we are going to have an education system, much of it online, where there is no interaction between two, student and teacher in person. I mean, that is one of the most basic socialization processes of socialization of learning that the child is watching someone. So, yeah, one can argue that when COVID-19 is over, we go back to that. I would argue that we should go back to that, but you're going to see less of it. The It's again like the rich, the elite, secede from this universe. Okay? They build their own online universe. So this is going to be one huge thing in education. The inequality divide is going to be multiplied when it comes to education because India is still one of the poorest, lowest spenders, probably the worst spender on education in a large nation, among large nations, nations with more than 100 million population or whatever. I think we are probably the worst in what we spend on school education. So that is going to be profoundly affected. Please also understand, my dear friends and the teachers, that unions and unionization are going to be affected very seriously. You're going to keep minimum physical interaction and association at the workplace. Right? So this is something that's going to be, which then moves me to the issue of unions, unionization, and the kind of issues that you're going to come up with. Already, the BJP-led states of 
Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh, which is not BJP led, but BJP governed because they came to power by a coup d'etat, have already declared, you know, that they can be, they have suspended most, almost all labor laws, but three or four. They have suspended labor laws on the demands of their industry and employers. The first of the bat, of course, was the Gujarat Chamber of Commerce in Mr. Modi's home state, where which asked for a ban on union formation for a year. And then some of them were saying even activity, not just formation, but even activity ban for the year. You're going to see this happening across the country, much more in the north and the Hindi belt, where there can be less resistance to it with the kind of people in power. Yeah. So that is going to be a very huge thing. Five states, not just BJP, but Congress states, have declared 12 hour working days. Do you, I mean, it isn't even mentioned or discussed in the media that this is a change to a hundred year old gold standard. The eight hour day for which so much blood was shed for mind you many of those guys who are now going to be working 12 hours women men and i'm sure children uh, are going to be working more hours for less money at lower pay because many of them are going back to lower pay now the idea of not of suspending labor laws is to be able to say nothing you're going to work also, the state is intervening as a, you know, as, as an ancient state did in crushing slave revolts. Look at what we did. First, we panicked migrant labor into running away from the cities by a speech on March 24th that gave people four hours to adjust to the idea of a lockdown across a subcontinent uh, and acro across 1.3 billion human beings. Yeah, they were given four hours. As the old retired IAS officer, Deva Sahayam, legendary in his time. He, by the way, he worked four years in the army as a major in Nagaland and Manipur before he joined the IAS. He's now about 80. Deva Sahayam pointed out that even a small infantry brigade, even a small infantry brigade is given more than four hours notice when it is asked to go into a major action. Okay. You have given 1.3 billion human beings four hours notice to shut down their lives for how many days now? Well over 40 days now, you've done that. Then, having panicked, now, migrant labor running away from the cities, I think they were being perfectly rational from their standpoint. They were being perfectly rational, A, because they knew they could not trust their government. They knew they could not trust their industry owners and factory owners and brick kiln owners and whoever. And they knew that they could not trust us, their middle class employees, employers, who immediately stopped paying the maids and the guard malis and everybody else stopped getting their money in many, many housing societies of this country. And then when they knew all these things, when they knew all these things, they panicked and they stampeded out onto the highways. Was there a different way of doing it? Yes. You should have planned several days. You should have declared all the closed schools and colleges and universities and hostels and community halls. You should have declared them shelters for migrants and homeless. You would then have had them at one place where a government that meant that meant to attend to their needs and their fears could have reached them with food, which you cannot do 
when you stampeded them out onto the highway. So then they are all on the highway. Yeah. Then on the highway, they are intercepted, you know, stopped at the state borders. Many of them have to walk back or walk somewhere or are pushed into camps. There were two kinds of camps. One are those where these people were picked up and put in the camp. Another, the better type of camp, the correct one, was what was prepared, explained to them, given to them as an option, and that was in Kerala. Yeah. Incidentally, as on April 15, 69% of all relief camps in this country were in the single state of Kerala. That's something you need to know. Second, apart from the relief camps, because so many people are stampeded out, millions onto the highways, then we had to start food camps. Then in the food camps, the number of people being fed at the food camps has long ago crossed, touched 1.35 crores to 1.5 crores. That's an outdated figure from April 12. It's probably 2 to 3 crores now. Yeah. Then we stop them at the borders, try sending them back. Then we tell them, no, no, don't try going like this. We will send you. Government will arrange for you to go. So then we put them and we say, we are organizing railways, especially organizing migrant labor trains to take you back to your homes. Then we charge them full ticket fare for travel. Even that when they are willing to, when many of them actually are paying the amount, Chief Minister of Karnataka has a conversation with the builders of Bangalore and others who are afraid of losing their serfs, their slave labor. Yeah. And then the migrant trains are cancelled. This is what we have done so far to labor. What we are doing is restraining them physically from leaving and deserting, abandoning their employers. We are restraining them physically by refusing, by cancelling those trains. Then, do you know how many people were in those camps, in the relief camps? Um, on March 31st, the government gave an affidavit in the Supreme Court saying 6.6 .6 lakh people and about 40 lakh people in the food camps. On April 12th, it had doubled. It said 1.34 million people in the relief camps and uh, over a crore, oh, sorry, one, 14 lakh, yeah, 1.4 million in the camps and 1.34 crores at the eating food at the food camps. By now, surely that number has doubled. I, do, I don't know. Because we have no mechanisms, no way of knowing. But the, these, were, these figures were from the union governments, the MHA's affidavits in the Supreme Court. Right. Now, having done all this to labor, having hold them back, restraining them physically, what do we do next? We pass laws. For 1,000 days, all labor law, all laws affecting labor, are suspended in the states of Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh. There, all labor laws are suspended. Okay? You are in you are in violation of your constitution by ordinance. Hmm? You're having an ordinance to no, you've not gone through any legislative process. Using ordinance, power of ordinance, you are removing the power. You are removing what minimal rights labor has. And the most shameful thing is the celebration of this. Okay? Please go and watch what the great editors of the corporate media are saying. One of them, you'll find him on YouTube, has said, this crisis, never waste a good crisis. That is the words, those are the words he used. Never waste a good crisis. This is the time to slam through labor reforms. My dear, the labor are in the state they were in 
because of the reforms of the last 28 years. Labor are in the pathetic state they are in because you have smashed so many labor basic rights of human beings in this country. You have torn away their security. You have informalized a lot of people who were in the formal sector. Hmm? There is 93% of labor in India which has no rights anyway because it's in the informal sector. They want to break down the remaining 7% and say that this crisis never waste a good crisis. In other words, what are they saying? We've got the bastards on their knees now. You know, they will do what we tell them to do. Yeah, you are actually creating a new form of bonded labor in this. What you ought to be doing is creating those conditions for labor of minimum wage, of a living wage, of a family wage, a number of, of benefits. Look at the fact that Mr. Modi calls upon people to beat their pots and pans and you know clang their pots and pans to celebrate the frontline warriors. Amongst the frontline warriors, and the frontline warriors are not just doctors and uh, nurses, they are there. What about the over 5 million sanitation workers in the country? These sanitary, many of these sanitation workers actually had full time jobs in government, employees of the corporation. With the neoliberal reforms from 91, we cancelled many of these jobs, threw these people out, outsourced the hiring of sanitation workers to, pri to private contractors who then hired, rehired the very same sanitation workers overwhelmingly if not totally dalits yeah hired the same people back again as contract laborers as contract laborers with no benefits with none of the benefits that government employees get second if there is anyone every day every minute on the front lines of the country's health round the clock it is two groups, giant groups of women, one called ASHAs and the other accredited social health activists, ASHA and Anganwadis. These are the people in whose hands the future of your children, the future of your expectant mothers, the, the health of your expectant mothers, the future of the Indian children, their health rests in these hands. What do they earn? 3,000 rupees. Now they've been given, oh, 4,000 rupees. And Asha is expected to do 12 primary tasks, 60 sub sub uh, tasks for 4,000 rupees a month. Yeah, they're sometimes asked to do census counts of cows and buffaloes in a village. Here is something what you could do and what many people like us have called for many years. Sanitation workers, Asha workers, Anganwadi workers. Immediately regularize them. Take them on as government employees and give them the same pay scales that you give other government employees. One lesson the elite is learning right now. Okay. And the middle classes are maybe divided in learning that lesson, but they're, they're learning. What we call essential services is essentially poor people. Yeah, the CEOs of the industry are not essential. Hmm? The celebrities are not essential. The poor people, the services performed by poor people. If you make a list of all the essential services, have a look at who is essential. Yeah, and instead of Instead of regularizing them, giving them favorable living conditions, we say, never waste a good crisis. We've got these people on their knees. Let's thrash these guys. Let them now proper labor reform. What, what more can you take away from labor in this country? So that's the second part of it. The first part, as I said, was education. 
the second part. By, by the way, one thing in education where you guys are going to be very important. Poor children are excluded altogether. And I know that Swecha, for instance, has done, or people belonging to Swecha have done lots of reaching out to poor children, collecting their stories, etc. We are now going to have to get in, all of us, or you guys are the front line in that, in dissemination of free educational content to children, whoever can access the thing, access the net, and whoever cannot access the net, we have to do two things. We have to see how we can get them net access, A. B, how we can reach them physically as well, outside of the net, offline. I know that several of you have been doing this, but the scale at which we have to now imagine this is very, very different from earlier. So I'm saying dissemination of free educational content. Otherwise, your net education is going to consist of Baiju and other corporations, which will make and they will so dominate the net content of online education that they will be setting the exam papers. They will be setting the question papers. And finally, they'll be correcting it as well. I'm saying this very seriously. And I am deeply involved in the dissemination of free education, con free educational content. I'll talk to you about that at the end of this. But we have looked at education. And, and then I need to collaborate with you. We need to collaborate for free dissemination of education content. We have an incredible amount of free educational content. We'll come back to that in a, in a, in a moment. Ah, so education. Then we've looked at labor. Third, most of this country is finding out that there is a creature called migrant laborer. Now, everybody is for after March 25th, the media woke up one morning and found that there are these people called migrant laborers. There are more than 400 migrants in your country. And of migrant laborers, there are about 130 who cross borders across the state borders across according to the census. My understanding is that even the census figures are a gigantic underestimate because of the kind of there are different kinds of migrants. There are long-term migrants. You know, I'm a long-term migrant. There are all those long-term IT migrants, Telugus, dotting the west coast of the United States. They're long-term migrants. There, then there are the um, seasonal migrants. Okay. That is the workers from Odisha who come to Andhra Pradesh and Telangana and work in the brick kilns during the sunny months when you can make bricks and go back when that season is over. Or the rickshaw or the agricultural laborers of Kalahandi and farmers of Kalahandi who go to Raipur in Chhattisgarh to pull rickshaws during the tourist season. Or the workers from Bihar and Jharkhand who go to Punjab for the uh, harvest or for the sowing. These are your seasonal migrants. They return when that's over. There are short term circular migrants, people who move in specific ways. There are your, this is the country with the largest number of communities outside perhaps of uh, Mongolia of nomadic pastoralists. Okay. We have them in the Eastern Himalayas the, the Brok Pass, the Western Himalayas, the Chang Pass, the Maldaris of Gujarat and Kutch, people who move 800, 900 kilometers each year. So you have very different kinds of migrants, but the, then you have these labor migrants who have been moving out for, you know, survival. And the most vulnerable group are not the ones who have necessarily found their jobs in the city. The most vulnerable group are called 
footloose migrants. They have no specific final destination. They will go around from place to place, place to place. Third, they've got 90 days on a construction job in Mumbai. Then they will all move to that contractor's brother-in-law's road, or road building or bridge building in Sangli. They have no idea where they are going to be two months from now. They have no clear calibrated plan on where they will go because they just need to keep moving. Many of them have working on the basis of an advance taken from the contractor and he can send them anywhere. So, but I, having said all this, I want to tell you that please do not restrict your problem mapping and your vision to only the migrant laborer. Every goddamn occupation and livelihood in the countryside has been smashed as hundreds of them have been smashed in urban areas as well, my friends. In urban areas also, they've been smashed. Hmm? Very often, those smashed in the urban areas are the high end of the chain, which starts out in the villages. How many of us know? Okay, maybe we know. But how many of us factor in our head that, you know, uh, how many of us factor into our head that handlooms and handicrafts are the second biggest employer in India after agriculture? Not IT, not any other in industry. Handlooms and handicrafts are the second biggest employer. What happened to them with the lockdown? I know you guys asked me to speak about COVID-19's impact on the poor. But I have to tell you, Praveen and Raja, I have to tell you that what we're really talking about is the impact of our response to COVID-19. The damage has come from our response. The damage has come from the lockdown. The way we conceived it, we didn't, we didn't really conceive it. We just went and made a bold declaration. We completely smashed millions and millions of livelihoods more comprehensively than we did during the demonetization or with the GST. Now you look at, incidentally, 95% in one estimate, 95% of hand-woven fabric in the world comes from India. Hmm? Now all of you sitting in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana and talking to me, please know that the weavers of Cherala and Pochampali are starving. They are starving. Okay, You know, I don't know whether I'm right, but I always believe that Chirala comes from the name, from Chira. You know, the name, word Chirala itself is derived from Sari, from the Chira. Yeah, because you have a specific brand, Chirala Sari. We say Chirala Sari, correct? The, and we are getting horror stories of how the weavers are completely smashed in Chirala. In one place after the other, in Telangana, that Chirala, okay, coastal Andhra, in Telangana, in Warangal, in Mahabubnagar, weavers are many of the. What happened after the lockdown? With the, see, in the 80s and 90s, some very well meaning elite people and middle class people in the development sector, I love them. They did great work. And as to save the handicrafts and handlooms, they brought them and linked them to urban markets. Now that did them some good, but A, it took away handlooms and handicrafts as a proper regular livelihood in the countryside and made it a more exotic one, dependent on the city markets. So the maximum earning, the maximum money that handloom and handy toy makers, weavers, dyers, spinners, the maximum money they make is from our Dilli heart, from the many festivals you have in Hyderabad in winter, where, you know, where people come and sell their things. The peak for these festivals, the peak for those where you sell, where the craftspeople make the maximum money in the year, those are held in. February, March, and April, and shut down as summer begins. What happened now? From February, many of those, like the 
Bandra Kurla complex, many of the festivals folded halfway through Dili Hat. So then, and many of them were cancelled. So you have, so you have a lot of weavers, a lot of toy makers, a lot of handwoven fabric people, a lot of craftspeople who had made huge piles of uh, products for those festivals. Two things are happening to them. They are sitting abandoned or in quarantine in the Dili hut, in the festival areas of various metropolitan cities, or they are sitting in their homes with stockpiles of inventory going to the roof and facing cancelled orders all the time. Okay. And again, I'm telling you, this is the second largest group of employed people in the country. Their employment is gone. Third, but I'll, I'll go back to labor in a, for, for a second, because when I said they're on their knees, what did I mean? The Center for Monitoring Indian Economy, which the Indian media are quite fond of the CMIE, but this time they're not publicizing what the CMIE is saying. The Center for Monitoring Indian Economy is telling you that this country lost 122 million jobs in the single month of April. In one month, in one month, this country lost 122 million jobs. Most of that, this is non-farm sector jobs, non-farm. More than 91 million of those are your small vendors, street hawkers, little kirana stores, tiny shops and stores, kaka kades, these things, many of them are not going to reopen. They're done. And cities will make all kinds of laws. We have done a kind of, if not ethnic cleansing, a class cleansing. Hmm? Watch how the hawkers come back. Watch how much, how difficult it will be for the hawkers to resume in the areas where the elite don't want them. It will not happen. It, they will make every kind of law against it. They are suspending labor laws everywhere. They are suspending labor laws. Okay. So 122 million people have lost their jobs. What kind of a response do we have in this country? We reopen thousands and thousands of liquor shops. This is the, you know, as the country is pushed greater and greater towards hunger, we are offering them a liquid diet. People have no money, no jobs, nothing. And you open the bloody liquor stores and draw two kilometer long queues, two kilometer long queues with zero physical distancing. And, and you say, we have to do that because liquor is giving us revenue. We'll come back to why states are reduced to having only liquor as revenue. But come back to the other livelihoods. In the People's Archive of Rural India in Pari, as of today, we have published 43 stories about every different occupation, livelihood. It's not just migrant laborers. We've published 20 stories on migrant laborers, but we have published about handloom weavers. We have written about your Chirala weavers. I, I can, you know, it makes you. It makes you cry to know what is happening to them. Hmm? I mean, some of the finest skills in the world are in Andhra Pradesh when it comes to weaving. Yeah, Golabama, uh, Chirala, Pochampalli, Venkatagiri. I mean, some of the finest, finest skills in the world in hand woven stuff are in our state of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. And, what, and they are in the process of being smashed. When the reopening happens, many of those weavers cooperatives will not exist. They will all be taken over by elite institutions. You know, um, they will have to serve the Fab Indias and the Vidyatis and other large corporate groups. That is what is going to happen to a lot of those professions and weavers. 
then toy makers all of them have been smashed but beyond that if you look at the people's archive of rural india we have a special master page where you can locate all the 43 stories and in those 43 stories you will find stories of boatmen from chitrakoot herders from uh, herders from ladakh maldaris the nomads of gujarat of kutch stories of the toy makers of varanasi mr modi's constituency stories of parai drummers in tamil nadu from the dalits stories of uh, carpenters of plumbers of electricians who were on the highway stories of farmers of in telangana where you are presently sitting praveen what has happened to the farmers in the rabi crop the farmers of nalagoda the watermelon farmers they grow a huge share percentage of watermelons in this country they are sitting there watching their crop rot they are sitting there unable to transport or and no intervention was made in the 20 days when it was crucial at the time when they could have been saved no intervention was made because no time was given by the government at the center for anyone at the local level to orient themselves and just make the adjustment and help these people and this brings me to maybe one of the most important the most important point i want to make to you today please please if you know if any of our kisan sabha friends are on this uh, on this talk i am begging you every single farmer in this country should switch should switch to food crop please do not grow cash crop in the kharif season or you and your family may starve that might well happen all those farmers who have cash crop in and perishable cash crop and non perishable cash crop look at look at maharashtra vidarbha sub 70 lakh quintals of cotton are lying unsold six weeks six months and then the cotton starts reddening in the kind of storage we have sugar cane i don't know how many lakh tons of sugar cane are lying with the mills you're not going to sell them do you think that in kharif you will have a successful cash crop you may well grow a very successful cash crop who's going to buy it consumption has crashed worldwide in the advanced industrial countries they're talking about 30 40% loss of income and a huge crash in consumption where are you going to export your cash crop who is going to buy your sugar cane which anyway is held at completely artificial prices in this country hmm? much higher than global prices when you have all these problems if you go for another round of cash crop i beg you all of you to remember that i remember i uh, remember 75% of indian farmers small and marginal guys are dependent on the are dependent on market on purchasing food grain in the market for their lives yeah you all know those who grow cotton those who grow sugar cane in andhra pradesh and telangana if they have if they have two acres every inch of those two acres will go in that cash crop for years how many kisan sabha meetings i have addressed where i have begged farmers at least one corner one patch half acre if not one acre yeah those who have four or five acres one acre please grow food crop on that for the security of your own family remember that more than four up uh, something like four fifths of farmers suicides in india are of cash crop farmers now i am appalled to hear that farmers in punjab and haryana are wanting to, are switching from paddy to cotton 
Oh, for God's sake, the millions of tons of cotton lying unsold across the world. Yes, you should switch from paddy because it's a water guzzling crop. It's not the major crop of consumption in the Punjab. So that's fine. You, if you want to switch to a less water guzzling crop, PT cotton is incredibly water guzzling. And secondly, I'm telling you, you need to switch to another food crop. You need to switch to millets. Those of you who are in this program who are from Rayalaseema, please know that your area of Rayalaseema, especially Anantapur, was once a homeland of millets. It was a homeland of millets. That is the way you should go. Those are much more nutritious than processed white rice. And they don't have the glycemic index levels of the rice we eat which is many times higher than that of millets. And I'm not giving you advice. I'm not following. I have been switching to less and less of the rice that I consume and eating foxtail millet and kodo millet, which I am, which I am accessing from Andhra Pradesh. So I really, really want that all of you should try telling your farmer friends we need food crop. Otherwise, those farmers and farm laborers, the farm laborer will starve in the coming season. Left with, they'll be given away. You know, I'll give them away so many tons of sugar cane and say, here, this is your payment. You go. That's what's going to happen. Then that's what on the farm front, the devastation is coming in more than one way. Right now, we are also telling people, hygiene, wash your hands six to eight times a day, hand sanitizer. Do you know what the government of India proposes to do? They have already given, they have given, I on March 25th pleaded with the government, immediately start distributing those huge stocks of food grain that you have, nearly 70 million tons in one estimate. 65 in another, whatever. But those to 70 million tons seems to be the consensus. You could have started distributing that immediately. And if you had put the migrant laborers into shelters, if you had provided them shelter, you could be feeding them, instead of which they're on the highways dying of hunger. And all this having been done, yeah, what is the government doing? They have announced that they have granted permission to convert huge stocks of rice into ethanol to make hand sanitizer for God's sake. You're going to you're going to destroy food grain. You're going to destroy food to create more hand sanitizer. Yeah. Another thing, my dears, hand sanitizer, the manufacture of hand sanitizer involves gigantic quantities of water. The real reason, in my opinion, is that a part of that rice will be, and by the way, the south of India and Andhra Pradesh will be particularly hit like the east of India because you and I are rice eaters. Okay? And the ethanol is being derived from the rice stocks. It's going to be rice that is converted into ethanol. The food grain, paddy, that grain is going to be converted into ethanol. I believe that a portion of that will go to it hand sanitizer, but the rest of it, maybe a bulk of it, will be used to blend petrol. Yeah, The beautiful people have got to be given, kept happy with their fuel. Right. The, and this is the anyway. So that's another thing that's going to happen. The cry as you eat into your food stocks to create ethanol and blended blended uh, ethanol with petrol, your food security goes for a six. And on top of that, if you end up putting cash crop in the curry, we are well and royally deep in shit. The one other thing, I mean, there are areas that we have not discussed, like uh, well, other sections, which fishermen, 
let me give you an example from your state of Andhra Pradesh. Okay. Vijayanagaram. We have a story on that as well. The Vijayanagaram fishermen, they, every year there is an official ban. I'm talking about, I'm sorry, I'm talking about Vishakapatnam where we did a story. Every year there is a ban from April 15 to June 14, which is the spawning season, the breeding season for fish. And fishermen understand that. And it's almost a self-regulated ban. You do not fish in that period. But it means that the two weeks before April 15 are the peak fishing period for the fishermen. They make their maximum amount of money on your east coast from that period of 15 days. All those 15 days were under lockdown, plus another week from March 25th. So they have made zero money. They're going out surreptitiously at night with great risks. And the propaganda that is going on in, in, in the, you know, from forces of fundamentalism and obscurantism, people are telling the fishermen, as they say in our story, that we won't eat these fish. They're coming from the east. These are Chinese fish and they all have coronavirus. Okay. This is actually happening. I know the temptation is to laugh at the ridiculousness of it, but this is happening. It is hurting your fish. So we could go on all night about how each section has been smashed, but we haven't spoken about what also the major sector called health. Hmm? A hell of a lot. Every day we are watching our, this country congratulate itself on its low number of deaths in the coronavirus. I'm very delighted that that is a low number. However, we are also having the lowest number of tests per million of any major country. So we really don't know what the heck is the status of the infection. Second, the way we've conducted our lockdown, I said this on March 26th, you can see we published it. A lot more people might die of traditional diseases because we have focused all the medical resources, which are very few anyway, to fighting coronavirus. And people are dying, diabetics are dying of strokes, heart patients, cancer patients, um, diarrhea on the, on the highways, people are suffering from that. We will never know how many people have died or are dying or are likely to die of non-COVID diseases let alone get a correct figure on the number of people who are dying of COVID-19 coronavirus. We need to fight for a gigantic national health system. That was a vision in going back to 1946-47, the Bore Committee, and the idea of having a huge health system. Yeah. Now, I, I don't want to ex elaborate on that because I've taken quite a bit of your time. Do you want to make this into a discussion on what we can do, what we should do? Or you have specific questions. I, I have not, for instance, covered the fact of, I, I, of why states are reduced to the revenue coming from liquor shops. There's a very good reason for that. And I have not covered what this is going to do to Indian politics, though you and I are witnessing that straight away. So it's up to you. What do you want me to do? What do you want to discuss? We have a few questions from the audience. Uh, yeah. You please read out the question. Uh, I'm doing it. So uh, will government make benefit out of this pandemic for corporatization of agriculture in India? As a question one, uh, should I read everything or should I? Read three questions, then I'll answer those. Okay. Even if farmers grow food crops, can we take it to poor instead of go downs? Second question. Yeah. Okay. So why? Uh, so why the prime minister is not holding press conference to address the meetings of the problems of the migrant workers, farmers, and of poor people? Is another okay. question? Yeah, let's stop there. Let me answer okay. those. Yeah, okay. Number one, 
you can bet your last naya paisa that the government will use the pandemic to further strengthen the population it's already done that by abolishing by by suspending labor laws can you guys hear me I, yeah it's already done that by suspending yes. labor laws by banning formation in gujarat already though it's gone to court there is an informal ban in place on the formation of unions um because the poor are in no position to fight back the workers are in no position to resist they are keen on reaching their homes and being with their families hmm. of course the pandemic is being used will be used to help corporations i've already told you how it's being used in the case of education how it will be used in the case of health sector even before pandemic look all this pandemic did was to do an autopsy of the last 28 years blatantly in front of you is the autopsy is the of all the policies of the last 28 years so you you destroyed what little existed in the public health system with your corporate hospitals look at the fact that countries like spain and ireland have nationalized all medical facilities to force corporate hospitals to force private medical institutions to do free testing for covid i live within range of 3 4 five star hospitals one of them is charging 6500 rupees per test a test that should not cost you should not be charging more than 1500 rupees and probably cost less and which in any case you should not be charging at all okay pain ireland nationalize their medical infrastructure Nash they will probably let it denationalize later i'm saying we need to build a national health system so yes it's going to be you know the education thing i told you that all the big private universities are already recalculating how they're going to make money out of this how edu corporations like uh, edu corporations like byju and etc are already raking in the money i've told you about how labor corp how corporations are how the governments are passing laws on labor taking away what few rights indian workers have so yeah that answer to that question is absolutely that is what will happen the second is if we grow food crops can we take it to the poor my dear if you have food crops we can think of taking something to the poor if you go crash crops you're not going to do a damn thing what will you take to the poor are you going to ask them to eat cotton hmm or vanilla or pepper no you how will you take it to the poor i'm saying that is where all of us come in when we struggle for a universal pds i have been arguing from day one of this crisis part of the autopsy what does it show us it shows us how fake our public distribution system and uh, national food security act which excludes 33% of the population one third of the population is excluded from that and i'm saying that you at this crisis throw out the requirement of ration card aadhar any other kind of id or identification nobody should be asked to produce such identification your migrant laborers and the laborers both the ones who have moved away and those who are still stuck in the slums in the cities their ration cards are of no use if your ration card is located in mahbub nagar and you are working in sangli in maharashtra of what use is your bloody ration card it was never of any use and you were paying market prices when buying your uh, grain now you can't even do that 
because your ration shop is not will you're not getting anything um you're not allowed to step out of your slum many of these slums are in containment zones in uh, in maharashtra and in a few other states there are even in bangalore <coughs> even in bangalore there are these containment zones where workers are stuck i say drop aadhar drop ration card drop all that nonsense and distribute that food that you have in your things so first is to knock off all that nonsense second is to and distribute what we have third is that i don't believe it's a question of if if we grow karif crops i think it's a question of what happens if we don't grow karif crops just visualize that i mean food crop it's not a question of whether we should grow food crops in the karif please ask yourself the question what happens if we grow cash crop are you going to reach that to the poor i'm saying that you need a universal public distribution system as uh, but elite get out of that by self selection and then you know way back in 2008 i was on the government of india's expert committee on the bpl census i wrote a note then which i will share with you a dissent note saying that all this aadhar had not even become a familiar name then i wrote in my dissent note that your i your it aided device id device is going to be a giant instrument of exclusion not inclusion and that it was is what it has proved to be i think that let me say this that whatever issues we are fighting whatever work we are fighting for hmm, from now on it has got to be through the framework of justice it's got to be the through the framework of food justice health justice and that framework has come from kerala where you have the mass movement kudumbashree which taught me the word food justice they 20 years ago they explained to me food sovereignty you can have food sovereignty and still have people starve you can have food security and huge inequalities where people still starve you can have theoretically enough grain for food security but inequality will lead to people starving we stand for food justice the producer shall not go hungry for example so this is the framework in which i would say we go forward food justice enforcement of six principles of the uh, directive principles of state policy of the indian constitution your third question why doesn't mr modi hold press conferences mr modi has never held a press conference open press conference where he can be questioned by any journalist he does interviews where the interviewer is a film star an akshay kumar or whoever it is he does interviews with um, you know with i don't know what right but he has never had the only leader of a major democracy in this country who has not held a single press conference and you are having junior officials you are having junior officials of the health department address press conferences and we have a junior officer of the health ministry address a press conference on railway tickets and whether whether they are free or not what the heck a health department official has to do with that because none of the senior secretaries no ministers are also coming on hmm? look at the i i wanted I, I, my answer to your question is this you are watching a major shift in the political system of this country you are watching the dismantling of parliamentary democracy legislature legislation cabinet government mean nothing the country is being presently run 
by one gentleman coming on to television and telling the nation what to do. Go beat your pots and plants, pants. Go light your lamps and diyas. Huh? Go and stand there tomorrow and we'll shower petals on you. You could have used that air force to shower the containment zones with ration kits and food. You could have used your air force for that. I don't think people are going to eat a lot of flower petals. So you are watching the complete bypassing of parliamentary democracy. You are watching a system being constructed where one leader commands the nation what to do on television. And that is what they have to do. Okay? So that is my answer to your question. That is the purpose of this. Why should I do a press conference? I can talk to the whole masses at one time. I'm the only one who has that power. That's what's happening. Yeah. So we have a few more questions. Uh, 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 can you elaborate on uh, uh, how the UP government decision to suspend labor laws for the next three years? That's another question. And what is the total volume of money the corporates have to pay back to the government? Uh, in terms of taxes and bank loans, and why the government is not forcing, and why is not the public, why there is no such much public debate in India? One, uh, see whether it's the UP government or the MP government or Karnataka government cancelling the trains, cancelling the trains of the migrant laborers. Why don't you face the fact that governments in this country increasingly have been of the corporations, for the corporations, by the corporations? Please look at one political party getting 90 to 95 percent of all corporate donations in the elections, which they then make secretive and do not allow you to gain information on which corporation gave how much money to whom? Hmm? That's one. Second, please observe that the dismantling of the political system is also happening in this with the creation of the PM Cares Fund, which bleeds the state donations and takes it away towards the center. There was a prime minister's relief fund. Why not? What is wrong with people donating to the prime minister's relief fund? They create a special PM Cares Fund, which is then exempted from CAG audit. All other funds are audited. The CAG will not audit the PM Cares Fund. So we will never get to know for whom the PM cares. But I can make a pretty good guess for whom he cares and where that money will go. So. The, I, the, the fact that this the government of, of the corporations, by the corporations, for the corporations, absolutely there is no question of, of that. The UP government and MP government are taking, see, the Karnataka chief minister meets, announces the trains, the trains are ready. He meets the builders of Bengaluru city, he cancels the migrant trains. I think that should be the answer to your question, where that's coming from. There is a sheer, uh, the kind of authoritarian manner in which UP has done it, yeah. You know, shamelessly, brazenly. But please understand that so many other governments are going to follow because they have to deliver for their corporations. Okay, why don't they, what about the amounts of money owed? Every year, the amounts of money owed to the Owed to the public exchequer by private companies and private corporations grows. Your bank and bank union comrades will tell you. If you can see on their websites on AIBOA, on AIBEA, you can look at how many, how much of those lakhs of crores already written off. By the way, quite a bit. Hmm? Out of it, it 70, 70, 75 percent is owed by businesses. But in the media, and that brings me to the question of the public discussion, it's all about NPAs caused by 
farmers non repayment of loans it's actually a very small portion of the giant total but this is how it is conducted why in the public discourse by which i mean if you are talking about the media who owns the media very often it's the very same people whose corporations owe that money hmm? the largest corp the i mean you you name it how many large corporate owners are heavily invested in media they don't even sometimes make much money from the media but they make money from other sectors because of their power in the media their ability to lobby with governments to get things concessions that they want leases that they want and secondly the marriage of government and corporation in india is particularly a particularly strong bond because most indian billionaires and multi 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 millionaires are what we call or what people publications like the epw would call rent thick billionaires they make their money by getting leases and contracts from the government on the public money and then subcontract and lease out i get i get uh, krishna godavari basin gas fields yeah and then i sublet and sublease and subcontract various activities around that which means that for those gigantic profits i make i have to have a very good relationship with government so it's best that i get the government elected that i want and that's why i give contributions to whoever i think is going to win the election 95% of my contribution to the election fund will go to that person to that political party so you're watching actually the consolidation of a corporate state this much is happening alongside are we watching the consolidation of an authoritarian state no it's much further than authoritarian much further than that i also think that your question leads us to look at i ask all of you to look at the media the richest man in the country is also the biggest owner of media mukesh bai is the biggest owner of media in the country okay the biggest corporations in this biggest media owners in this country are giant corporations and their operations in media have been incredibly profitable until recent times yeah uh some of the media companies like bennett coleman and co the times of india's owning company over a 30 year period the kind of profits they make would be the envy of most of the companies listed on the stock exchange that kind of money they're making because they're not only making it in terms of their operations in uh, media but also in other operations please know this bennett coleman and co opened a bennett university a private university in lucknow in in uttar pradesh yeah in uttar pradesh and with land that was cleared after a lot of trouble why on earth would you expect them to have a discussion on adityanath please tell me that yeah he can screw up their university land deal which is anyway a do pretty dubious one he can screw it up with a snap of a finger so i'm saying you have okay let me put it this way guys who rules india <laughs> and i'm saying this is precedes modi hmm? i'm talking about an a larger alliance a socio political alliance a socio political economic alliance not just one specific government but with this government it has fructified in full your country is ruled by an alliance of socio religious fundamentalists on the one hand and economic market fundamentalists on the other and they've had a very happy marriage and the bed they cohabit is called corporate media hmm. and there are many people who are both market fundamentalists and religious fundamentalists 
the, your 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 prime minister your home minister the late mr arun jetli are all people who have a foot in both camps market fundamentalism and religious fundamentalism a lot of market fundamentalists the clever clever young bright men on of the neo liberal world trotted out every night to talk to you on television these are the same guys who have never predicted anything right on the eve of 2008 they were telling us that the world is more prosperous than it ever has been and everything went down the tube in september october 2008 with the wall street collapse did any of them say anything about the scale of damage that you would witness now until it was obvious to anybody who took a look the same guys who had no idea what went wrong are now trotted out on tv to I mean, who have, are now trotted out on tv to tell you what went wrong your many of these look the whole issue the kind of mainstream economists you have they can they are people who are fundamentally in rejection of the idea that inequality is a problem whereas the one thing that covid-19 talks tells us yeah as i have told you for the last hour or so the one thing covid-19 shows us is that the pandemic is not equal it is no great equalizer as i hear some anchors say it actually brings out the fragility of those at the receiving end of inequality in this country which has grown in the last 20 years greater than it has grown at any time since the 1920s that is the kind of inequality in your country now i need to make an appeal to you we'll, i'll answer further questions I'm, i'm here for you but i need to make an appeal to you and i need to make a a collaboration proposal with you i want to tell you one thing the good news first you know people's archive of rural india didn't discover migrant laborers on march 26th if you look before march 2020 you will find in the preceding 10 years not a single discussion on migrant laborers in this in the television world of india not one no panel discussions no experts no great imf or world bank chief being interviewed in the studios nothing 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 we cover migrant laborers around the year now the first thing i want to tell you is that um we are a non corporate non government media and the good news is that in the last 40 days our viewership readership social media presence has grown according to the platform by 2 to 5 times it's doubled everything has doubled hmm. because we actually perform a service without any revenue without any benefit and we are finding we are cracking under the strain because we are doing it without any money since all the donors are sending their money to the pm cares fund do you know another trick about that fund if you are a corporation and you send your money to the pm cares fund it can be counted as csr if you send it to the chief minister's relief fund it will not be counted as csr okay so every now our donors are small medium one or two people in csr etc one one man or one woman companies or whatever like that but mostly individuals have given us our thing and obviously and i understand it it's moving towards the uh, direct funding on what they think is fighting the covid but our indicators have doubled and grown and we have opened up a new creative section for poetry and songs and music and i am going to catch yashwant after this program and ask him to collaborate with us on that with the rest of you i'm asking you a start 
getting on to being regulars with we are putting up a story every day on covid on the kind of issues i've been talking to you be regulars on pari make us more visible help us in social media in tweeting in retweeting make donations however small our reporters are going out and taking risks okay they're getting passes like one young person in chitrakoot and going out and doing stories from the these are not expert conversations in studios these are with people migrants on the highway these are with a with boatmen in chitrakoot with fishermen in vijayanagar actual discussions through their voices and through their words third in a few days we are opening our full fledged education universe called pari education already dozens of colleges and universities are on this platform and this is a place i am going to i am going to argue we should provide the alternative to byju education okay this is for children free of charge it's also a platform where the children can write and read according to the grade or class or whatever which class they are in which standard they are in we already have a large number of students uh, stories done by students of for students but we are going to try and create that content you should also know that we publish in 12 13 languages including telugu but i am we are very weak in telugu because we haven't got enough volunteers for translation i need you to know that we can really go about fighting for that public space in online education all you guys it activists you and we we can do this together yeah. please get on to the platform make little donations there because they're going to fund some reporter who's in the field yeah sir uh, we are more than glad to collaborate uh, with you uh, 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 from swetcha uh, uh, we'll be glad to uh, take the challenge we'll help you with the translations we'll help you with the social media we'll also help you with other tech related th things uh, just now we had a confirm we also have a, uh, a confirmation from chaurav satyam they also more than happy to collaborate with you that's wonderful i think I I am astonished and shocked that I have not come across this group before. I feel I've lost out on knowing them. So, uh, do we have? Uh, so we have a few more questions. Uh, shall we take them? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. So uh, there are two questions. Uh, uh, so what is the amount of uh, loans that are taken by the farmers compared to the loans taken by the corporates? Uh, that's question one. And uh, another question is, can you please explain the difference between a write-off and a waiver in the context of NPAs? Uh, I am not the best person to tell you about this, but I can tell you about farmers. Uh, if you like, say if you look at the some, you know, they talk about thirty-six thousand or Maharashtra being distributed amongst how many farmers? Sixty-nine lakh farmers. Please find out what that amount was. Waiver was can be a very different kind of thing. It can be a waiver on the interest. It can be a waiver on the loan. repayment for that year or for that season hmm. a write off is what they do for corporations please know that again i'm telling you look at your comrades in the banking sector they are giving you this information almost on a real time basis okay they are much more uh, equipped to tell you exactly what the position is today i can tell you that over 70% of npas in india in the indian banking system over 70% of the npas came from business particularly big business in fact the newspapers would not touch it 
even when the all india bank employees association put up the names of defaulters year after year people in parliament left mps primarily demand the names of the big defaulters in various bank the situations and the finance minister whether congress or bjp or whoever says we cannot violate the laws of banking secrecy now this is so pathetic hmm? i have been in anantapur reading the newspaper inadu where they publish the names of all the poor people whose gold is going to be auctioned yeah there is no there is no banking secrecy for poor people their names you go and hammer into a sheet on the panchayat board more than 70% of the money comes from a handful of businessmen whereas the portion of coming from farmers loans is divided amongst millions of farmers and you get a sense of how small that amount is the latest and the best figures for that will be on the website of the banks and you can ask them the corporate there's another thing the modi government also went into these mudra loans most of these were given in a huge rush before the elections you are not going to get that money back you are not going to get that money back yeah uh, then i mean there is there is one then don't forget there is that almost 1.5 crore loan that you can get in you know advertised as 59 minutes we will do this for you hmm? um the entire banking system is being smashed from within to favor the corporate world and you will ultimately hand over these banks to the corporate world in the other time and meanwhile not a single bank has gone bust because of corporate of corporate uh, not a single bank has gone bust because of farmers loans on the other hand look at one private bank after the other taking gigantic sums of public money going bust and then being absorbed in a non zero npa public sector bank they are absorbed in a zero npa public sector bank oriental bank of Uh, commerce punjab bank they had to take on those private banks that collapsed but at the end of the day a few years from now it will be the owners of those failed banks who will own the banks that have now played host to them this is the standard procedure in which this goes so number one farmers loans we had demanded we demanded two things okay i am also one of the conveners of the national of nation for farmers a platform of non farmers like there are it for it you know it workers for farmers there are software engineers for farmers many of these groups coalesce into a platform called nation for farmers we came out of that we we were born as a result of that historic march of the farmers from nashik to mumbai 182 kilometers in 38 to 40 degrees heat long before covid the farmers loans not only do you write off those loans i was arguing that loans are one issue we need a minimum we need a minimum 3 week session of parliament this is the demand 3 week session of parliament to debate solely and exclusively the agrarian crisis and related issues related issues would be water land reform all those things are tied to the agrarian crisis so that is the way you're going to look at it farmers loans have to be cancelled but that does not solve the problem it be, because next year the person will be back in the problem because the sources of the torment of the farmer have not been dismantled as and one of those things speaking of comparisons with i'm saying 
if you want agriculture to survive in this country, and by the way, agriculture is now going to come under very severe pressure because millions of people whose livelihoods have been destroyed in the cities are now going back to the land. Look at the amount of, while 122 million jobs have been lost, agriculture is showing a greater number of people at work. Now, one of the things you need if you want a future for agriculture in this country, get corporations out of agriculture. As of today, everything in agriculture except direct ownership of land, except direct ownership of land and the act of daily cultivation, everything else is owned by corporations. Who owns the seeds? Corporations. Who sells the seeds? Corporations. Who owns the who who manufactures and controls the pesticides? Corporations. Who controls fertilizers? Corporations. Those great subsidies to fertilizers were never subsidies to farmers. They were producer subsidies that went to those companies. And there have been gigantic racketeering in that. So all of this, um, you need to get corporations out of agriculture. Agriculture has to go back to communities, to people, not to profits and power. Again, I tell you, some of the most innovative things in this have happened in your own country. Look at Kerala, look at the Kudumbashree movement. I think that there are many lessons and it is absolutely inspirational. In 35, in 30 years of covering the countryside and 25 years, of looking at the uh, of looking at the farm crisis and i have the only group of farmers i saw making profits were the landless women of the sangha krishis of kudumbashri and they were doing very well until of course they were completely smashed by the floods in two years which reminds me that we haven't discussed how serious the threat to indian agriculture is from climate change, which is also very closely related to the industrial path of development and the particular capitalist path of development we have chosen. Please look at the world today, how clean and fresh the air is. How clean. And let me tell you this, how relevant it is for you as of today. Because just two days ago, government has announced that to favor industry, environmental clearances, forest cutting clearances will be processed on a priority basis and some of them will be done, officials say, in 10 minutes, not 10 hours, 10 minutes. You can see a story on the Quartz magazine website on this. Environmental clearances available in 10 minutes. So one, we are going to destroy that environment again. Two, the people who are being displaced, those farmers who are being thrown out, under the present, while these clearances are going on, they cannot present their case. There is no provision in the National Green Tribunal. There is no provision in our environmental laws or in the impact assessment laws for people to do online presentations. Right? So... That is also going to be a very, very serious problem. All these issues should make us, I, but, but you look at Kudumbashree, you look at the inspiration they're giving you. They are growing mostly, where they grow food, it's mostly organic food. They are providing the cheapest canteens in Kerala with high quality food. Indeed, they are the people who are now running those kitchens. Many of those kitchens run for the migrant laborers are run by Kudumbashree. It is a different kind. It's a solidarity economy. Yeah, you have something like it in Brazil. You have something like it in one or two other countries. Kudumbashree has 4.3 million women members. Of how incredibly successful it has been. I'm saying that we need to do this. And you also need, I think, that we need to now firmly make, I particularly need to tell you guys this, the development debate from now on has got to be 
political, not technological. It's got to be politics first, because it is the politics that decides which technology, whose technology, technology for whom, who takes the decisions of what technology. All these are political decisions. Okay, so that's one very important thing. The second important thing is go out there, and uh, now you can argue explicitly politically. Against what capitalism and particularly neoliberalism have done to people in this country and development, yeah, you are going to watch the right as one of the questioners asked. Yes, you are going to watch the right seize on this in a very big way. It already has. We need to get out there with our alternatives. We need to get out there. People are stunned. Many of those middle classes who have been dazzled. By global neoliberal globalization, are in a state of okay. Maybe it wasn't such a great thing after all. I think we need to start thinking: How are we going to? No tinkering of policies is acceptable. No removing one spark plug of one brand and putting a different brand spark plug. Tinkering is not on the agenda for me. We need an agenda of transformation. And each of us has got to see how we can do it. We, we in the media, you in IT. Let's do it together. Uh, Sainal Guru, we have more questions, but uh, we're running out of time. Uh, uh, maybe we should invite you for more talks, um, or find more pla uh, 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 a platform, you know, to be in touch with you regularly. So, I, I think we'll stop the questions now. Uh, Okay, and uh, uh, thanks for all the viewers uh, uh, for joining us in the live. Uh, we're very happy to tell uh, we have almost uh, three thousand plus uh, unique viewers for the live today. Uh, we have uh, we we have uh, graduates, uh, IT employees, even uh, 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 people from different unions have joined the call today. Mm, okay, and uh, one more interesting thing I forgot to tell. So Pari, okay, yeah, yeah we'll sure tell the people. So uh, uh, the viewers, you can look at the uh, uh, poster uh, uh, at Sainath Garu. Uh, it's Pari, which stands for uh, People's Archive of, of uh, Rural India. You can also find their website, uh, ruralindia.org. Yeah, Rural India Online. Rural India dot online dot o r g. Rural India Online, one word, one word. India Online dot o r g. Okay. Yeah. Okay, one second. Here you are. Um, this is the. This is our URL. You see it? Little more closer to the yes. Yes, this this looks fine. Yeah. So it's ruralindiaonline.org. And it's um, in 12, 13 languages, including Telugu. But we are weak on Telugu. And we we're kind of proud to tell that uh, Swecha uh, helped building the website. Yes. Uh, and maintain. Yes. Yes. Mm. yes. So I, and one more thing I forgot to tell you. So when you were uh, uh, giving a proposal for Charas to collaborate, the Charas team was telling they, they, they tried many times to reach you out uh, from emails on Twitter and other platforms. Uh, it's like, you know, kind of dream come true for them to get a proposal from you. We'll be in touch with them. Uh, you guys send me that. I, oh, by the way, uh, I'm going to request you. I will send you. I will send you and uh, your group a document with the 40, 43 stories with the links and summaries of the stories, so that people can pick which stories they want to. Read. And the master page link. I will send it to you. Can you send it out to all those viewers who have given their email or handles to you. Let them get that document. It's one word document. And uh, you can see where all we've come from, where all we have reported from. And people, you can write for us, provided you tell the story through the voices of those people. Not No essay writing. No uh, personal thoughts. We want to hear the voices of those 
brick kiln workers in Vizianagaram, the fishermen of Vizag, who are welcome to participate in the in this exercise. So I will send you that document immediately after. So uh, we also want to thank all the viewers and uh, especially all the Swecha activists who were very active in, uh, you know, uh, uh, campaigning to all the sections of people about today's thought. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, you heard uh, Sainat Gar, uh, Garu proposal. Uh, I request all the Swecha activists uh, to enroll to this uh, initiative and I also request the viewers uh, who are listening to this talk uh, please reach out to Swecha if, if, if you can uh, uh, collaborate with us, if you, can, if you want to participate in this initiative uh, uh, in building the tech platform, what Sainath Guru was proposing. You, you can just simply write to uh, reach us at swecha.net. Okay? Yeah. And once again, I want to thank all the Swecha activists uh, uh, for making this uh, you know uh, happen and you know to re increase our reach. You know. 3000 plus uh, unique viewers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, see you soon in uh, another uh, uh, event with you. We can, we can do this. I'm in contact with so many of you. I'm going to do it often. I would, it's my privilege. So, viewers, uh, uh, so we, we can close for today and we have some exciting uh, announcement for the uh, next uh, series, uh, next talks in the series of switch public talks uh, uh, i think uh, please follow us uh, uh, at uh, switcher.org that's our website and also you can follow us in different social media platforms we have a common username in uh, across the social media platforms you can find us with a name called switch fsmi uh, you go to social media platforms our username is at the rate S W E C H A F S M I. So we are on Twitter, we are on Facebook, we are on Instagram, we are on Telegram, all the proprietary surveillance platforms, and we are also on the uh, Fediverse. Uh, the Fediverse is you know the the social media platform built by the free software hacktivist. Uh, you can find our social media uh, platform at fsmi.social. So I'll end this call by inviting all of you to join our social media platform fsmi.social which doesn't track you not a surveillance platform and completely and 100% free software platform fsmi.social Sainad Garu, I also hope to see you on our platform Okay viewers, thanks for today Thank you, thank you so much Sainad Garu.